Uh, we have to think about these different hypothetical scenarios, different possible worlds in the future, and that means you have to think about who these people are in the future. This is why you need a philosopher in chief. <laughs> Yo, what is going down? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week we are going to do something interesting, something that totally goes against my mental framework. We're reading <laughs> analytic philosophy this week, man. We're reading some analytic shit. Yeah, dude? Yeah, this is my favorite because I get to get some weird ass perspective on things that I never would get otherwise. And I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if the questions that I ask are like questions that like an analytic room, if I were in like a seminar room, they would just look at me like a two headed monster, you know? Yeah, but which is great though, I think. I think it's, it's wonderful to get these kind of perspectives on things because I'm not going to get this in the seminar room. I'm not going to get this from anybody that I'm, you know, talking to um, in my you know, general vicinity. So, it really kind of shocks the thought a little bit to have you read this stuff and respond to it. Yeah, and the crazy thing is, is I was actually thinking a lot about a particular Sartrean concept known as the practico inert that he develops in Critique of Dialectical Reason that fit quite well with a lot of what, and for people who haven't heard yet, but we're going to be talking about Derek Parfit's, what is it, Reasons and Persons? Is that the name of the book? Yeah, I mean, Reasons and Persons is a huge-ass thousand-page book, and we're reading the... Um, uh, just the sections on the non-identity problem and the repugnant conclusion, which are kind of some of the most famous pieces of the book. Okay. But he develops, you know, these various arguments, which I actually really like how he just like throws out all these different arguments. But anyway, one of the arguments in particular, and then I think all the arguments kind of fit into this, but one of the arguments in particular was about like these two energy uh, possibilities, right? There's the energy possibility that like in the future. Conservation the, and depletion. Yeah, and then something could go wrong in the future, and like, are we responsible for that now? But I'm like, holy shit, dude, he's asking these like questions about like ethical responsibility in relation to what Sartre refers to as counter finality, and and I was thinking about all these like long extended passages in Critique of Dialectical Reason where Sartre makes a similar argument about Chinese deforestation and how they thought it was a great idea, but then by kind of creating all of these canals and stuff like that, it actually just increased flooding in the future and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, there's like a it's so similar, you know, yet so, so, so very different at the same time. <laughs> but yeah. I'm going so, uh, forward to so that. that. Yeah, it'll be fun, man. So that's what we're going to talk about in the main segment. But before we do that, we should mention that uh, you can support us on patreon.com slash Isles of Dawn. And we have multiple tiers of supports if you would like to do that. You can get various goodies such as the bonus episodes that we produce every once in a while, at least once a month, but sometimes more. Um, the ability to um, read our monthly newsletter, and, of course, the ability to contribute to choosing our next patron-sponsored episode, which we should mention, um, the new poll for patron-sponsored episodes is now up on patreon.com slash Dawn. So if you're a patron, go over there and uh, recommend some new topics. And if you're not a patron, then please join Patreon so you can contribute new topics. Yeah, that's right. I think I think that's all the housekeeping shit, yeah? Yeah, limited today. Sick, man. So you know what we gotta do before we start talking about some some non-identities. I'm ready. We gotta do our shitty minute. This is the part of the yeah. podcast where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that's grinding our gears the last week or so. So, Austin, what's got you down? All right. So uh, you know, I got a few things. I feel like I've always got an arsenal in my back pocket that I could whip out for the shitty minute when it's my turn. And the list of grievances. Yeah, I, exactly. I've got my list. Right. And the funny <laughs> thing is, is the list rarely carries over like two weeks later. Right. Like, cause you know, it's every two weeks that I get a shitty minute, but it's really funny. Cause if I have a list of, let's say like five possible options, it's very rare that the four that don't make it like last for another two weeks. And then it's like another five. So it's really strange. <laughs> I would, I wonder what happens they're to those purged. four. Like, yeah, there's a regular purge. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I have a few things that I could kind of pull out of the back pocket. But this one is is kind of a shitty minute, but it's also kind of funny because I do find enjoyment out of this addiction at the same time. But lately I have really gotten into following this YouTube channel by a guy named Matt Does Fitness. 
okay? And he's this British bodybuilder slash former power lifter slash former cross, uh, like track and field guy. He was like a long jumper and a triple jumper or something like that. But anyway, the dude is like, you know, he, and then he like went to school for like sports science or some shit like that. And he was a PE teacher and whatnot, but now he's a full-time YouTuber and he's got sponsorships and whatnot. And anyway, like he's super charming and he's got like his son that is in his videos and his wife is in the videos and they just kind of have like this like really charming vlog style and he kind of you know is like it's 90 percent him but then the way that he incorporates them is really cute like his son's name is luca actually and uh shout out luca Doncic. um <laughs> but uh his son luca uh always does like the intros with him and they're always like really funny and He's like two years old, but the, he's super sharp, right? So they always make it really intriguing. But one Dude, of the things that, putting your kids in your like social media, like YouTube or podcast, whatever, that's like cheating, man. It's it's a hundred percent cheating because if you look at the comments too, like eighty percent of the comments are like, "Oh, I love Luca. I love the intros." <laughs> da, 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 da. It's like, yeah, okay. Uh, and his wife is fit, so it's like it's he's got he's got he's it's good, man. It's a good channel, right? <laughs> But anyway, the shitty minute comes down to the fact that it's not just him, but it's like a lot of other YouTubers have been doing these. It's like a, a what I eat in a day kind of thing. And at first I was like, why the fuck do I give a shit about what you <laughs> eat in a day? And then and then I kind of got into watching these fucking pro bodybuilders like these. I think it's like is it the IBFF or IBBF, whatever it's called. I don't remember. But the International Bodybuilding Federation, maybe. Maybe it's IBBF. Um, I, I would watch them because I was just so fascinated by what they would eat. Because it was like chicken and rice weighed out to the perfect proportions every <laughs> single meal. And I was like, oh my god, that's so fucking boring and awful, right? But I kind of got into it because I was just so fascinated at the curiosity that these human beings just treat food literally like oil that you put into a machine. And I was like, God, it's so strange. But then I started watching these other ones where it's like these guys are doing these like 10,000 calorie challenges, these 20,000 calorie challenges, 25,000 in a day. They would eat that much. And it Holy was just shit. so fucking baffling to me. And I was just – and I got so fucking fascinated. And then I was like, okay, but these bodybuilders are kind of fat too, you know, like in the off season, they do like dirty bulking and they get kind of fat and then they cut down really lean when it's time for competition season, like too lean to the point where they're like three, 4% body fat. And you're like, are you going to die? But anyway, this dude, Matt does fitness. The thing that makes me angry is he consistently, I mean, he uploads two or three videos a week and he consistently eats like 5,000 calories of McDonald's and KFC <laughs> and Krispy Kremes. And I'm so angry because he's so jacked and ripped. And I'm like, what the fuck, dude? Now, he trains hard because he's like a power lifter. So he's probably burning a shitload of calories as well. And he's a pretty big dude. He's like, 6'2", and I think he's like 90-something kilos, so he's pretty solid, so he probably needs a fair amount of calories, but not 5,000 calories of like 700 carbs in a day, and I'm so fucking angry because you have just shitloads of people out there that are working hard, they're eating disciplined, they're doing intermittent fasting, whatever it is that they're doing, and you got this motherfucker who's got a <laughs> banging wife, a cute-as-fuck kid, and he's got a ripped and solid-ass body, and he eats Krispy Kremes every fucking day, man. And I'm just angry at it. It makes me so frustrated. But nevertheless, <laughs> I'm addicted and I can't turn it off. I like keep watching the videos. He'll do a video where it's like, all day I'm just going to eat KFC. And he eats KFC all day. Or all day I'm going to eat ice cream for 24 hours. And he eats ice cream for 24 hours. That or I'm going to see what happens. Dude. <laughs> dude, it's insane. It's fucking insane, man. You should watch these videos because one, they're infuriating. And two, you can't stop watching because they're fucking charming. Because he's got like this weird kind of he's, – he's almost a little like ADD and he says the same things over and over again. He says AKA all the time, like also known as, right? He'll be like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym AKA here. And it's like <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, I'm having this food AKA known as Burger King, you know, like or whatever. It's like he just constantly says AKA like 10 times throughout the video and he says sick all and, – and so it's actually super charming and fun. Um, and he does know fitness and he does know lifting and training, but it's just, he's on, cause you know, there's different theories about fitness. Some people are like, you gotta be keto. You gotta be paleo. You gotta do low carb. He's like, fuck all that shit. It's just calories in calories out. 
right? So it doesn't matter what the calories are, but calories in, calories out. Um, and, you know, as long as you get your solid proteins, then he's cool. And I just like, it makes me so angry because I'm telling you, the guy's body, just look at Matt does fitness on Instagram and you'll see this dude's body and you're like, that's the guy that does 24 hour, I'm only going to eat McDonald's or I'm only going to eat Burger King or I'm only going to eat KFC or I'm only going to eat ice cream or Krispy Kremes or I'm only going to eat food from 7-Eleven or whatever these challenges are. And you look at that body and you're like, how does that body maintain like that level of definition with that fucking diet? It's just fucking ridiculous, man. Dude, I think that your your fascination with the eccentricities of random people is like an addiction that is going to go wrong given YouTube's proclivities. <laughs> I mean, you might not be wrong, but I'm curious how you think this could take a wrong turn. <laughs> I mean, could take or has already taken. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a possibility that I have already gone down the wrong path. <laughs> yeah, life. I mean, I'm just thinking like, because like you see all this weird shit on YouTube, which is just, you know, full of, it's just, people talk about the, the tubes being clogged, like YouTube is where the tubes are clogged, Yeah, which is all sorts of shit. Like this like huge um, manifestation of, of like reaction videos, that, that new genre, which is just people reacting to random things that have existed for like forever. Like here's a tree, my reaction video to this tree. It's like, yeah. what the, what the why, why would I care about this? And so you see that and you're like, you had the same rational response, right? Which is why the hell would I care about this? But yes. then you watch one and you all of a sudden you're fascinated by how weird um, reality can be, right? And I, I, I just wouldn't be. I would just, first of all, I would never even try. But then even when I did, I, I would be like, this is stupid, turn it off. But you get so interested in the like, weirdness of people. Um, it's like, it's empathy gone wrong, dude. Like you have too much empathy. You gotta shut that shit off. When you say you here, you mean you as in you, Austin, not like the broader you. I mean, both, but specifically you, Austin. <laughs> it's an empathy problem. You gotta, there's a spigot, right? And you gotta like, you be able to turn that thing off when it's harming you. Do you think it is an empathy problem? I think it is. I think your interest in, in, in the weirdness of people definitely is an empathy issue. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's because you that's you get into it and you just decide you know what I gotta find out more about this because I'm I get you automatically get interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do to turn off the spigot? I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's got auto shut off when shit like that comes up. <laughs> oh man, yeah. It's so funny to me. You talk about you know YouTube being clogged. Like two months ago, I didn't even know this guy existed, and now. I mean, he's got, you know, over a million subscribers or whatever. And now I kind of see him as being like a node in the network, you know, like an important node. If you think of YouTube, the tubes as being like this web, right? And you've got big nodes and small nodes. Like now I'm kind of like, oh, he's like a, he's got to be a big node. I mean, he's not like PewDiePie or something, but still he's got over a million fucking subscribers and some of his vids have like tens of millions of views. So you're like... Fuck, how, how did I go so long without even knowing about this node as like an integral component to this network? Or is it even integral? Like, does it even matter? Is there such a thing as an integral node in the interwebs? Or are they all just kind of superfluous? It's crazy to think about that there's some random YouTuber out there who I've never heard of and who will never, ever cross my path in terms of you know um, me witnessing it. And yet it might have more of a cultural impact on people. Yeah than like some big time like HBO TV show or something or some movie uh, yeah. than like people who watch that, Parasite for instance right which I think yeah. is or, like the, or, or like the Irishman yeah. the Scorsese film yeah yeah <laughs> one of the greatest filmmakers in the history of the world and people are like who but nevertheless there's like this guy out there named Junk Jack John who's like got <laughs> the 30 million subscribers who's influencing people with 100 million view videos you know yeah, and this is not like a like a like a purist um, thing where you're just you know uh, the, the plebs have their own entertainment, lowbrow entertainment, and we have our highbrow entertainment. It's just it's just interesting to to cite that that fact, yeah. right? That that's the case. Yeah, this it's is purely dis this bad, is descriptive. Yeah. No, this is yeah. descriptive, not normative. Yeah, yeah, not evaluative. Yeah, it's just purely descriptive. Yeah, I know. Uh, Wait, did so you anyway. say like I almost caught you at one point saying that this guy, in addition to saying AKA all the time, also says sick. Yeah, all the time. So yeah, uh, yeah. The, yeah you, almost, you you were starting to say that and then you stopped because I think you were going to reveal the fact that this dude is basically an OC bro. Except he's from like the south of England. But yeah, but he's an OC bro, like in terms of identity, right? 
Yeah, he totally is. He's got that energy that like a lot of my homies have back home. He, yeah. Yeah. So this yeah, is what this does. is about, right? You, you just want to like bro out with some, with some of your old bros. Well, but so here's the deal. So here's the seductive element to this. So I got a buddy who talks about this constantly. Oh, Darius again, uh, who talks about this constantly, that there's a type of aesthetic, that there's a type of personality, that there's a type of affect that is very common among YouTubers. It's like the YouTuber voice. And I guess there are some videos about this as well. It's the YouTuber style, the YouTuber voice. Like everyone is like, hey, and it's not just the jump cuts, um, which is one element of kind of like the formal aesthetic style that like creates certain patterns and habits within us that kind of keep keep us uh, attended to the YouTube videos. Like when I was working uh, as a producer in content creation, one of the things I can't remember, and this was a few years ago now, but one of the studies was as like, you have seven seconds, I think, or maybe it was three seconds to catch somebody's attention. And that's what it was. You have three seconds to catch their attention. And then it was like every seven seconds, you need to add something else to stimulate their attention. So it was like a sound effect or a transition or a jump cut or like a pop-up or something that would re-trigger their their sensibilities so that they wouldn't turn off and click to another video right um but beyond just that there's also this like performance style and it's so funny because i feel like it's a very southern california la like ryan seacrest type of host style very flashy and pseudo charismatic and over enthusiastic and it's that pure positivity that you know we, we were talking about um but nevertheless it's been exported throughout the world and so it doesn't matter if you find a youtuber in india or in fucking nigeria or in chile or in toronto um that they all kind of occupy and mimic that same space and it's really fucking strange and i do see it it's like this weird mimetic thing you know we should start a youtube channel called like the suffering hour where we just read off all the terrible things that happen in the world purely descriptively with no jump cuts and a totally morose monotone voice for like and it's got to be like five hour long stream yeah exactly it's like slow cinema but slow youtube <laughs> dude let's start slow youtube <laughs> <laughs> well that we call our channel slow tube yeah i'm into it let's do it you know how they have like what is it philosophy tube or whatever it is yeah. ours would just be slow tube let's do slow tube let's see what happens fucking a all right done <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's my shitty minute matt does fitness i love him and hate him what can i say all the best shitty minutes admit that there's always love and hate. that's true all right so should we jump into this uh perfect mess yeah, I'm going to let you lead this, if you don't mind. One, because I know you're doing some writing on this, but two, you probably understand it uh, a little bit better than I do, and you've dealt with it a little bit longer than I do. And three, you're just a very good teacher, so have at it. I don't know about teaching at a microphone, though. It's a whole different world, you know? That's true. Um, but yeah, let's do it. So uh, Derek Parfit was an English philosopher. Uh, he wrote this um, pretty influential book called Reasons and Persons in the mid-1980s. And he's another example, I think we talked previously about, uh, I think the last episode actually, about the kind of publisher parish model that um, dominates academia today and that it's, you know, the world is, academic world is so much better when you can take a long ass time um, to work on and develop uh, something. And I think I mentioned John Rawls as an example of someone who published their first book in their like 50s or something, uh, A Theory of Justice and how, it was so much better that he didn't have to, you know, develop 30 articles before um, right. doing that, right? He was able to cut this really comprehensive book, which changes an entire field of philosophy. Parfit's kind of similar. Um, he only published two books in his entire life, Reasons and Persons, and then On What Matters, which came out in like 2011 or something. Um, and they're both like thousand page books. So they're huge, right? <laughs> but um, he was able to work on these for, you know, most of his life. And they're, you know, incredibly influential uh, and important in those fields um, because he was able to work on them for so long and develop them through seminars and everything else. So mm. uh, another example of, of that phenomenon, which I think is is good and important. But I don't think we need to do too much of background here. Parfit actually, surprisingly, I, I kind of want to like, hear your opinion on the stylistic nature of his writing because I find it exceptionally clear but weird. Mm. Did you have that same response? Um, yeah, see, okay, so it's hard for me because, so I don't read a lot of analytic philosophy, 
so for me it's it's always um uncomfortable when i do read analytic philosophy one of the weird things is he uses a lot of like first person stuff which like just in my mind it just like frazzles me i'm like ah stop saying like i this and i that i'm like ah <laughs> so it it automatically just creates this weird like i have to i become conscious and aware of it and it kind of like distracts me which is strange right um two it's kind of dry sometimes oh yeah but then totally. but then he also uses these like anecdotal or these like uh like um what's the word i'm looking for like thought experiments you know about like a 14 year old pregnant girl or like you know um this energy solution about like burying nuclear waste or whatever and and those intrigue me and that's where i kind of get excited you know with the anecdotes i'm like all right cool like and then it just goes back to like dry again and i'm like oh, and it's the God. most like dispassionate way of doing thought experiments right <laughs> yeah like is this is you read a ton of analytic philosophy at the moment is this kind of standard fare no it's not i mean <laughs> the dry, the dryness obviously is i think um um but he has even within that kind of uh writing style uh, his own unique like you almost wonder when reading it does this person know what they're talking about like who is this mm. like it almost sounds a, a bit and at times like undergrad writing it's in that it's kind of simple and mm. then you kind of see the big picture of it and like oh shit no that's just like super um important and makes like a really good point it just takes a long time to get there um, yeah, sometimes he'll be like, okay, because here's, uh, here's this position, and he's like, you know, and I know some people that believe that, but most people don't. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait. <laughs> <I know>, right? <laughs> is that, that, is like that grad writing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not rigorous analysis. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, he'll just like t talk about a position and say, yeah, but most people think that's wrong, and then move on. <laughs> yeah, but most people think it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, wait a second here. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, you definitely can't do that in analytic philosophy. You're not supposed to, right? You already have to have tenure to say shit like that. <laughs> I mean, but even even in like the continental theorists, they don't say stuff like that. At least not not so explicitly, right? Like they will generalize and they will appeal to like anecdotal evidence, but it's not so like bold faced. Whereas this is just like very yeah, it is undergrad. It's just very simple, kind of like, you know, casual almost. Yeah, and I think it's it comes off that way because it kind of seems like he's talking to himself. Like, oh yeah, and this position comes up, but you know what, I don't have to worry about that. So let's move on to this next thing. Um, whereas, you know, analytic philosophy is, kind of prides itself on this professional style, which, um, you know, every article has to fit this uh, certain certain parameters, um, within a, you know, a relatively narrow scope to be acceptable or to be considered scholarly, right? And and perfect kind of um, eschews some of that uh, in ways that I think are interesting and fun. And I, I kind of appreciate even though I don't, I don't really adhere to any of Perfect's positions. I kind of appreciate that you know, someone who's never read um, analytic philosophy but has, you know, some intellectual background can probably read this stuff and, and follow along pretty easily. And that's not something you can say for most, you know, important analytic philosophy. Like you ain't doing that shit with like Quine or something. So then, I guess my question for you is: is if you don't always agree with his positions, then what draws you to him? I mean, his style's weird as. Is it that you kind of find the style quirky and worthwhile? Like, what is it ultimately that draws you to him? Because sometimes I found some of his conclusions to be a little bit, um, like, overly simplistic or commonsensical. And not that there wasn't some rigorous work done, but some of them, I'm kind of like, you went through all of that to say that? I'm like, okay. I mean, I, I guess I get it. But I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, what draws you to him? Like, why would you, why did you suggest these readings, I guess? Well, I mean, most importantly, it's just because it's, you know, hugely influential in okay. the ethics literature and specifically in the environmental ethics literature. Um, okay. So for that reason, I wanted to talk about it, especially with you, because you have an interest in, in that field as well. Um, but then, you know, I th also think that it's um, the problems that he introduces here are, are really important. And I don't think that the way he casts them or the way that he, or the conclusions he comes to from them are accurate, but I do think they're things you have to kind of deal with. Um, and also Parvitt's kind of unique in, um, and he's, he's more or less, you know, kind of a consequentialist of sorts. Um, but he also thinks uh, uniquely that there's a sense in which the major ethical theories are all kind of the same. 
he kind of posits his position um, in his later work on what matters that um, they're all like different mountain climbers climbing up the same mountain from different perspectives and they all mm. get to the same thing in the end. And I think that that's ultimately wrong. Um, but it's, it's unique uh, of a position. And unlike most consequentialists, he, he understands where like, you know, virtue uh, ethicists and, and deontologists are coming from, um, which is not the case for you know, most consequentialists think that everyone else is crazy. Um, so I, I appreciate um, the perspective that he, that he has. Um, but yeah, mostly uh, I wanted to just talk with you about this non-identity problem. And if we have time at the end, the repugnant conclusion, which is um, a really interesting idea, I think. So uh, should we get into talking about what that is? Yeah, Rook, before we go into the actual two, can I ask, I'm I'm surprised because you told me before I read this that he was very influential in the sphere of environmental ethics, which not that I'm surprised. I mean, I think it it's almost like one step removed from what he's specifically saying is the application mm-hmm. into environmental ethics. But what he's speaking about isn't directly about environmental ethics. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And so I'm surprised. I'm, am I surprised? I guess in a way I am kind of surprised that he would be this huge towering voice. And I figure is it more like in the 80s when he wrote this book, was this immediately perceived as something applicable to environmental concerns? Or is it more now that we're kind of like thinking about our responsibility to future generations that people are now turning to this and saying, therefore, we can look to him for moral considerations, ethical considerations, et cetera, et cetera, as we wrestle with like ecological breakdown. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if the immediate reaction was the was the case, but I do know that, especially now. Um, okay. Given that we're, we're we're much more attuned to the fact that the actions that we have now have uh, very demonstrable um, and and negative effects on future generations, that you know, Parfit brought this up in a theoretical space, right? He didn't really, as far as I know, didn't really have um, an understanding of that we have now of the sort of uh, breadth of the uh, consequences of our own. Um, you know, environmental policy will have on future generations. And yeah. yet he kind of anticipates that in a theoretical space. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's something that someone, someone would have, would have, would have like come up with this um, now if he hadn't given that it's, you know, mm. obviously an important issue, but he ah. kind of anticipated it before. If somebody else would have come up with it, would that be a necessary, what does he call it? A necessary distinctive factor or something? Like, it wouldn't be right. Is that, and never mind. you know, how so? <laughs> no, because remember he's talking about Kant at the beginning, and he's like, "Well, if somebody else came up with it, then that means that it isn't like a necessary distinctive trait or something like that." That Kant wrote Critique of Pure Reason. So then, he oh, goes, like the descriptive view of persons dis- versus yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a good that's a good segue actually, because that's like the beginning of the whole thing. You kind of have to assume a certain view of identity for this whole problem to work out in the first place. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the he kind of um, contrasts two ways of thinking about. Um, Identity, which is actually the section of the book before this, is on personal identity. All right, so Parfit contrasts um, what he calls the time dependence claim from something like the descriptive claim or something like that. Uh, and the basic idea there is um, the time dependence claim says that uh, every individual was conceived at a certain time. If you had not been conceived at uh, basically that time, uh, you would not have existed. And that's contrasted with the descriptive view or something like that, which says that a person is basically the certain like important things that they did or something, right? So if if Kant didn't write the Critique of Pure Reason and someone else did write the Critique of Pure Reason, that person would have been Kant um, and not the person who we call Kant himself, right? And, and he thinks that view is incoherent uh, and that the time dependence claim basically has to be right. And like, so in a sense, in a sense like your origin um, is necessary to your identity, right? You have to have had the origin that you have. Um, so that was interesting to me. The, the, there was the time dependence, the descriptive, and then like the origin one, cause he's talking about like, what is it that makes, that gives someone a necessary identity, right? And he says that some people would say that it's the origin. It's that like, singular moment of conception that makes that person Kant or that makes that person Troy or that makes that person Austin or whatever, right? It's that singular moment. If it, if there was a conception that occurred a day later or three days later, it would have been a different sperm 
And so that different sperm would have created a different like set of combinations in its fertilization of the egg. And so it would have different like biological traits and whatever. Even if I was raised by the same parents in the same house household, only like a couple of days apart or whatever, there would still be like a different um, like necessary quality of a person's identity, right? And he doesn't he doesn't seem to like that either, though. Well, he does think that the origin is necessary. Um, so he, he he gets this idea. Okay, it is, but it, but that's but that's not what gives somebody their singular identity, right? I mean, he, it may not be the, the exhaustive of their identity, right? Um, but he gets this idea from Kripke. Kripke is kind of the okay. one who introduces this idea against the descriptive view. Um, that origin is necessary. So, um, I mean, I don't know the biological. Isn't the biological factor like the gametes that you come from or something like that? Um, like the sperm and the egg have to be um, the same, right? If they if those are changed, then then mm. a different person has been conceived, right? So yeah, and there's like thousands of possibilities or millions of possibilities with every like ejaculation or whatever, with every potential fertilizing moment, right? So there's. There's tons of possibilities of persons, I guess, or or let's say of origins of of conceptive uh, acts or events that could take place. Yeah, and so you know we can we can pretty easily and logically think about a person as being different in almost every case, right? You could have different physical features, and, and certain biological features can be different. Um, we can think of these possible worlds where one individual, one numerically identical individual, is, is you know, qualitatively different. In different possible worlds but the one thing we can't do according to this view is view them as having a different origin like coming from different parents or from a, even a different sperm and egg um and that seems to me pretty intuitive like that's at least at the very least that who knows what identity is right personal identity is but at the very least that seems to be consistent with like the, the normal way we think about who an individual is and the descriptive theory does not seem to be the case like it does not seem to be the case that if kant um, had you know, like become a sailor instead of a philosopher, and then someone else wrote the critique of pure reason. They would have been Kant. Like that seems obviously wrong, right? They would have yeah, had yeah, the yeah. influence that Kant had, right? But they would not have been Kant, right? Yeah, but then I mean, wouldn't we even take it further and say, like, if a if if uh, if a different sperm fertilized that same egg, like? an hour later, a day later, or even just in that instant, then that person that that is, if we're going to say in like some sort of like hypothetical scenario, then that person actually doesn't even exist. Like that that person doesn't have a beginning because the origins, the origin event is completely transformed. So even if it comes from the same parents, then that entire event it creates a completely qualitatively different embryo and then person, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you're saying like, if it's the same same sperm and egg, but different time. Yeah. Even even at that case. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm, even if it's a different sperm, but even if it's the same sperm and egg at a different time, then yes, I would still say that that person is not the same person. Qualitatively. That I, qualitatively, I think it seems to make sense to me that there's like a necessary. It's contingently necessary. Like it could have been otherwise, but if it could have been otherwise, then I think that it would have created a different necessary set of like effects. You know, like it would be a completely different person. Qualitatively or numerically different person. <laughs> well, so what's, yeah, what's, what's the difference between, between qualitative and numerical difference? Cause he does talk about that. Yeah. So basically qualitative difference just, um, talks about the, the qualities or features of a thing, right? So if you think about okay. a tomato, when it's a green oh, like, baby tomato, and then when it grows up okay. and becomes a red ripe tomato, that's a qualitatively different tomato. It's got different qualities, like it's color and it's shape and it's size and it's firmness and it's everything else. Right. Um, okay. But it's the same numerical, or it's the identically same, or numerically identically, uh, excuse me, the numerically identical tomato, because it's the same one and the same tomato, right? Over time. Oh, yeah. So that's the difference between okay. qualitative and numerical identity. Well, I mean, I just have a fundamental problem with the idea of identity per se. So I would. Oh, yeah, of course. I, I We're have just a, talking here about the I way get, we just kind of typically think about these things. Who knows what personal okay, yeah. identity, an identity itself actually is. Yeah, and even the notion of numerical identity, I think I have a problem with. But um, but it, it but from from within his framework, um, wouldn't it also be the case that even let's say the same sperm and the same egg at a different time would create a different uh, 
well, I guess both – could it be possible that it would be both numerically different and qualitatively different? Uh, it would be qualitatively different because – um, the conceptive process would be taking place at a different time. So then the embryonic process is taking place under different conditions, even those like micro shifts, right? Um, you know, uh, does the person ingest this food at this time in this way? Does the person cross the street? Does the person smoke the cigarette? Whatever it is. And then the, the time of birth might be different. And it creates this entire chain reaction of effects that would create this whole different um, kind of like chaotic field of complex complex variations that would then shift so from the moment of conception to 10 years later you're talking about such a vast shift in degree and variation um, of effects that you would then have a radically different person at 10 than would have been the case had the conceptive act taken place you know a second before or an hour before or whatever no yeah i mean i think he's he's mostly agnostic about um, about that issue, since that's an empirical question, and he's not trying to you know, answer empirical questions. Right. Okay. But, that makes sense. But it, it's true that you know that would actually help his ultimate case, right? If it, if um, the qualitative right. differences were even greater than we're kind of assuming that they are, he's just saying at the very least, if we're gonna have the same person um, in different scenarios, they're gonna at the very least have something like the same origin, whatever that origin okay. empirically ends up being, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems, I mean, is the point in in making the theoretical case this way so that you can have that, like, necessary foundation, whereas, like, the descriptive case doesn't really give you much of anything to kind of hold on to, but the, the origin perspective from within the time dependence theory that he espouses at least creates a set of, like, necessary principles. Right. Yeah, there's a necessary condition on what makes someone the same person over different possible worlds, and that's kind of the idea, right? Because we're thinking ultimately about okay. what happens if we if we act poorly in terms of um, like environmental policy, for instance, on future generations, and what happens if we act in like a, a good way um, and prudently towards the future. Uh, we have to think about these different hypothetical scenarios, different possible worlds in the future, and that means we have to think about who these people are in the future, right? And so we have to have yeah. some sort of idea of um, what the identity of these future people actually is before we can start talking about our ethical and moral relationship with them. Right. Right. Which, which is where the kind of paradox comes in because you're making a kind of speculative gamble on the assumption that, um, you know, that identity endures in a way because – if you then simultaneously say that the actions that we that we take in the present actually affect like the identity of those future persons, then you're actually kind of saying that we we kind of create, we change the identity of these future persons. And so there's almost a sense in which there's like a, a gap between who the persons are, let's say now, the identities now, let's say the conglomerate of identities now, and what the potential conglomerate of identities will be, let's say a hundred years from now. There's almost like this this speculative gap or leap that you have to make that kind of um, uh, makes a type of gamble or a type of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, um, the way he couches it is the difference between, he calls them same person choices and different number choices. And he has a weird way of coming up with these terms that sometimes are really confusing. But the basic idea is almost always when we're thinking ethically about um, whether we should do something, especially like a political or governmental level where it's going to affect lots of people, we assume that in different hypothetical scenarios, if we do policy A or we don't do policy A or we do policy B instead, we have the same people being affected, the same persons being hmm. affected in all three of those scenarios, right? But it's right. actually not true when you come to choices about affecting the future because you might have a choice like enacting a certain policy, which changes the very identities of the people who will exist. That's right. So you might, in one scenario, like you enact policy A, and then persons A, B, C, and D will exist. But if you enact policy B instead, that will change when people get married, when they have sex, when they um, actually you know, procreate. And so persons A, B, C, and D won't ever exist at all, and persons E, F, you know, et cetera, will exist instead. That's right. <laughs> yeah, which which is a very interesting way of 
thinking about things. I mean, I think it's an accurate way too, but I think it's very interesting because it kind of does seem counterintuitive to the way that like political policy making is generally run, right? It doesn't it doesn't really consider that. I mean, I don't even know how it would effectively kind of consider this like non-identity problem, right? This is why you need a philosopher in chief. But um <laughs> Like, but, but even more but than it, just political, like even ethically, like we just don't think about, we think about whether we should do a thing or not. Oftentimes, if we think about how it affects people, we assume that all the hypothetical scenarios that are available to us affect the same, the numerically same people in those different hypothetical scenarios. But sometimes they don't, right? And he, like he uses the, you mentioned earlier, the, the example of like the 14 year old girl or whatever it was, right? Uh, which he has a very like, kind of cringe-inducing, dispassionate way of thinking about um, this poor young mm. girl, right? Which is very typical of like analytic philosophy, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, this young girl can just can think about, well, should I have a child now when I'm really young, like a teenager? Or should I, you know, uh, postpone this, you know, get a job, make some money and, and have a child later and then give that child, in, in some sense, maybe like a better life or like a, a less risky life or something like that. And we, we usually think about that as being like a hypothetical scenario where the girl is thinking about the same, the same person, right? In both those scenarios, yeah. the, the baby now, the baby later, but it's not the same baby. It would literally be a different identity if origin is necessary to identity. It'd be two different persons she's thinking about. So you're not actually, in a sense, if you sort of have a baby now, you're not actually making, um, you're not actually doing that instead of like, making that baby better off in 10 years. Because it wouldn't be that baby anymore who's born in 10 years. Yeah, I was thinking about this. So a lot of times he talked about, like, would the baby be worse off? And and one of the things I was thinking about while I was reading this a lot is, like, you know, the word worse is syntactically a comparative term, right? Yeah. Um, but even even words like good and bad, they may not be syntactically comparative, but I think they're conceptually relative or comparative terms. And so, um, like, better is obviously syntactically comparative, but like the word good, we don't tend to think of it necessarily as, as being necessarily relative, but I think it is. I mean, I tend to think that all terms are and all words are, but, um, but so this idea that like, that you can make a comparison with non-existence seems to create a really strange aporia, right? Yeah. So like... If, if a 14-year-old has is pregnant and has a child and then you say, well, the child would be better off uh, and have a better quality of life if she would have the child in a couple of years or under these other different conditions. But how can you make that statement itself when you're comparing it to non-existence? Non-existence is necessarily non-qualitative and you can't compare nothingness. Not in like a Hegelian sense or a productive sense or anything like that, but in just kind of like the simple sense of not existing. You can't you can't ascribe qualitative um, notions or concepts or designations to it, right? So it creates this weird aporia. Well, part of it thinks you can um, compare uh, the qualitative uh, content of a zero to. Yeah. some positive or even some negative. And you know, I, I also had the same intuition at the beginning, which is you just can't compare someone's positive or negative existence in terms of like the quality of their life to not existing at all. That just seems something, it's like, it's like dividing by zero. Like the answer should be right. undefined, right? But here's, yeah. here's a counter argument against that, which I actually find kind of plausible, even though I don't come at this from the same like um, consequentialist or utilitarian impulses that, that this argument tends to follow from. Here's a counter argument that is, I think is kind of intuitive. So do you think that it's possible that it, that it's, that it's, it could be in a sense rational for someone to look at a life, which is going to be relatively short in terms of maybe like days, long, days longer from their current state and will be full of suffering. Like maybe they're in, in, a, in a concentration camp or something. Um, and there's no, conceivable way they could ever escape and they're going to die. Like it's just going to happen. It's like as guaranteed as it could be in someone's experience. And for them to look at that horrible scenario and, and decide, you know what? Non-existence would be better than that. So I was thinking a lot about this with reference to suicide and that, um, is it David Foster Wallace that talks about like when you're on fire yeah. and you jump out of the, 
So I was thinking about it in relation to that too. Like, because a lot of times you hear this, that the person is seeking the alleviation of suffering. It would be better off if I were dead. You hear that kind of language, right? That comes out of like people dealing with suicidal ideation or whatever. And I was thinking, is this not similarly running up a, a kind of similar aporia? And so I wonder, and I don't know if this is me splitting hairs, but I wonder if there's a difference between like, the phenomenological or psychological speculative notion that's like, it would be better if I weren't suffering anymore. And then the kind of more ontological, right? Whereas I think the ontological is incoherent, but the psychological, because it's from within a type of sapient, reflective, positional condition of suffering, and all you're seeking is the alleviation of suffering, but really you don't want non-existence because non-existence isn't better. It isn't better per se, but nevertheless, relative to what you're experiencing now, you just think that that's the only possibility of alleviating suffering. But if you could alleviate suffering in a lived condition, that you, then you would do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're right in the sense of, um, there's just, it seems like, like Parfit and like maybe utilitarians who make this case are, are coming at it from a quantitative position, right? Like there's a, there's a yes. greater quantity um, of like yes, a better yes, offness yes. that's in the non-existent scenario. So, you know, that's that's available to you as a comparative case. Whereas you're saying you know, it's it's about quality. It's a qualitative difference, right? It's like a, even a, ph- a yeah. phenomenological difference in terms of the quality of suffering is so great that simply to end all qualitative experience um, is preferable. But I do think you're still making an evaluative claim there. You're not just, because you you're actually convincing or like doing some account of practical reasoning where you're coming to the conclusion that I need to, I should, um, make my life cease to exist. Um, right. But here's my point, but isn't it maybe wrong? So like, it's not actually true that not existing is better. Oh, sure. Legit, like, yeah, yeah. Can- it's not because it, because it can't be better because you can't have a qualitative designation attached to nothingness, but Nevertheless, it seems as though it would be better because it seems to offer you the alleviation of suffering that you desire. Yeah, I mean, I think that you definitely could always be wrong about those things, right? Um, but it does yeah. seem to me like, even if it's the case that you know persons are always wrong, or you, you, you're rarely ever engaging in like careful deliberation when you're in intense suffering, right? Um, right. But it does seem to me like there's some sense in which you can compare those. You can compare non-existence in certain cases, very minimal cases, maybe to the qualitative states of actual existence. So if, if Parfit's argument goes wrong, I don't think it necessarily goes wrong at this minimal point. Um, but I mm. do think you're kind of seeing the like seeds of where things can go mm. wrong here in terms of the, the better off, worse off thing. And he, you know, this is kind of notorious for, for uh, philosophers, right? Because he's, he's trying really hard to not make moral claims, right? Mm-hmm. He's trying really hard to make an evaluative claim, right? About better off and worse off. But as, as like minimal as possible, um, he doesn't even use the term harm, really, right? Um, but instead, t- talks about better off and worse off, and talks about it all the time, right? It's like as far mm-hmm. as he'll stick, step his feet into the shallow end of the pool. That's right. Of uh, like value theoretic claims. And I'm really glad you mentioned the notion of like quantity versus quality because this was the thing that was like that that caught my attention the most is that. It seemed that he was operating under a type of analytical rationality, I mean, obviously, but um, in the sense of like a pure quantitative or mathematizable logic, right? And especially when he gets to the repugnant conclusion is obviously he's weighing up these different uh, quantified uh, options or quantified scenarios, right? Which we could, which you can explain in a minute. We can talk about it in a second if you want. But the thing that I just thought was so interesting is that he doesn't really pay much attention to the idea of um, the qualitative experience of like the individual, or um, it, it does seem that there is this this possibility that he um, ascribes to being able to kind of exchange one scenario with another scenario, and that. Um, like that there is a sort of calculus that can help us to decipher what is better and what is worse. But he doesn't really actually talk about like what I would want to do is he doesn't really explain the qualitative essence of betterness or of worse offness, right? He kind of just assumes, and now maybe he does earlier in the book, but he kind of just assumes that quality of life means something that is 
commonsensical. And he kind of just assumes that better off is um, easily understood in a kind of like pseudo, I mean, it's kind of almost a natalist kind of perspective, right? This, And so I, I kind of just thought there was something kind of lacking in that as well. Yeah, he, he admits that, um, he, even, he even says in this chapter a couple of times, um, whatever it is that that quality of life is, right? So yeah. he's being purposefully agnostic about it, but then proceeds to say whatever that thing is, X, quality X or whatever that makes life worth living, let's quantify it, right? So let's remain agnostic yeah. about what it is, but it's content, but we'll quantify whatever it is, which assumes, of course, that it you know can be quantified. Um, right. So you kind of have you kind of have to if you want to continue with the argument, just work with him and see uh, what he thinks about quantifying this whatever this qualitative experience is that makes life worth living, remaining totally agnostic about it, about what it actually is. Yeah, and isn't that kind of interesting? The phrase that uh, that life is worth living because he kind of just assumes that any life has that. Um, that value, right? That any life is a life worth living. Well, it doesn't have to, right? He admits that, you know, if, if, if we make future lives not worth living, so whatever it is that makes life worth living, we take that away, then that's automatically going to be, you know, ethically problematic. The weird, okay. the weird gray uh, area cases only come about when you make lives worth living, but barely. And then you include this mm. whole non-identity issue. And then isn't the kind of, sin let's say for lack of a better word of making lives not worth living isn't it precisely like that you're depriving them of like it, it, it to me and this is how i read it is that you're depriving them of that sort of like essence of life that is already geared towards being a life worth living like that's how i kind of read it i don't know if that was totally wrong but i kind of read that there was like this assumption that life is worth living and therefore it's up to us to maintain that status of lives worth living and it will only go awry if we somehow take these conditions away and then we make lives not worth living and then that would be on us as like our moral blight well yeah, he says that it seems very intuitive that if we make life less worth living than it currently is for future people we've in some sense done them wrong right or done wrong in yeah. some sense but you can't actually his point is given what we've accepted so far if we follow his argument you can't actually say that we've done any harm to those future people to them specifically because of this non-identity issue. So this was, let's bring up the environmental yeah. issue here because this is where it really becomes okay. apparent, I think. So he has these two scenarios, one called conservation and one called depletion. And conservation is one where we do a really good job of safeguarding the environment such that um, all else being equal, life is, you know, life on earth for human beings is basically the same as it is for us for future people. Um, depletion is where we, don't do that. Instead, we use up all the resources and make life much worse um, for future people in terms of uh, the environmental context in which they live. Uh, and he didn't have, I don't think he had any idea about climate change um, in this scenario, but obviously is like, obviously applicable. You can't read this now without thinking about climate change, right? It's exactly what mm. we're doing. We have the choice between you know, reducing emissions such that we can keep the world uh, more or less habitable for uh, currently existing species, including ourselves, or we can just continue emitting fossil fuel emissions and then uh, make life much worse for the vast majority of species on Earth and even ourselves. So mm. it's it's almost exactly parallel um, to these two cases. And he says, it seems obvious to us that depletion is wrong. There's a, sense that there's a reason we should not do depletion, right? Uh, but it's kind of hard to see what that reason is. Why shouldn't we do depletion? If your argument is, well, we shouldn't do depletion because we'll make future people worse off, then if we did conservation, that's actually not true. Because if we do conservation, a certain set of people will exist in the future. And if we do depletion instead, a different set of people, a different set of numerically uh, different people will exist in the future. And those people won't be worse off than they otherwise would be because otherwise they wouldn't exist. So as long as they have lives that are minimally, at least minimally worth living, if we assume that's better than non-existence, then they're actually not worse off. So whatever reason we have for not doing depletion, it can't be because we're going to make people in the future worse off since that's not actually true. So he kind of removes mm. the reasoning, the practical reasoning, which you think would make us um, believe that depletion is bad and says, if you're going to say depletion is bad, it has to be for a different reason than that. That's where like mm. the holy shit, 
I can't believe that's the case. Like, you know, shock moment comes in, right? This is where Socrates convinces you that you don't know what you think you know, right? <laughs> the Apore. He's gaslighting about. us is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's right, though. So if you accept the argument to this point, then there's some sense in which the non-identity problem creates an issue for any sort of practical reasoning which you engage in, which tells you you shouldn't do um, depletion, you shouldn't you know, destroy the environment because it's going to harm specific individual future people. There's some sense in which like, uh, that logic follows. Well, what about the idea, though, that depletion erases the minimal uh, quality of life? And to where it's like negative? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at that point, then, you, you do have that reasoning that allows you uh, to do that. But, um, okay. can, but, but can, we break, can we break it down, though? Just walk over this really slow, like I'm a, like I'm a high schooler. So the argument is, is that because the actions that we undertake now actually affect who people are in the future. Um, yeah, which people is he, it, exist. Yeah, which people exist. Like there's literally a it's a constitutive act, right? Yeah, think about um, it like um remember Back to the Future? When yeah. Marty McFly goes back in time and almost makes his parents not meet at the high school dance or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. And then the picture of him starts disappearing. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's a non identity case. Where if you okay. make certain decisions that make people not end up having sex at a certain time, then different people will exist in the future. It's that on a okay. large scale. So then how do we go from from that, which I am okay with, to then – is he then saying, so therefore we aren't morally responsible for these persons because these persons don't quote unquote exist or like what what's that next step? Yeah, so I mean he's assuming that with these two scenarios we have, conservation on the one hand and depletion on the other, that depletion is wrong. He's saying, I will not give up that depletion is wrong. It just obviously is wrong. My question is, why is it wrong? Like, what's the reason that it's wrong? And he says, well, the, if you asked anybody why depletion is wrong, they would say something probably like, well, it harms future people, right? And maybe even people now, but especially it'll harm future people because we're using up all the resources, right? And they won't have- the Well, you hear this all the time, right? This is one of the main arguments, even in like popular political- ecological debates right is like uh, this is one of the main arguments even of like the student strike yeah. is that you know you guys need to this is our future kind of thing you know and i i don't know if i want to raise children in this kind of world or like i, I want to create and secure a future so that i can have children so that they'll experience the same benefits that i do it seems to presume um this this identity this linear identity yeah this idea we talked about earlier which is that in ethical cases we almost always assume that in different scenarios the same people will exist which right, right. is not the case um yeah so it's like a fossil fuel exec going to greta thunberg and being like yeah well if we hadn't burned all those fossil fuels you probably wouldn't exist so ha huh, <laughs> you should thank us um which obviously would be uh, incredibly bad thing repugnant <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would be repugnant right so it's part of what i was getting at is that Something's going wrong here in our reasoning that we need to figure out. Um, so yeah, the point is, if we're going to say depletion is wrong, which it definitely is, if we're going to say, you know, embedding fossil fuels such that we're going to, you know, kill most species on Earth and make life really bad for people in the future, that's obviously wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, the reason, Perfect says, the reason can't be because we're going to make individual future people worse off than they otherwise would be, because otherwise they would not exist. If we hadn't done depletion, they wouldn't exist, right? right? So we can't say that, well, you know, they would, they would be worse off than the people who would exist under conservation, but those would be different people. And usually we don't say right. like, you know, um, well, you know, I, well, Austin, why shouldn't I like hit you with a bat? Well, because then you'd be worse off than this other guy who's next door to you. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's not the reason why I shouldn't hit you with the bat. I shouldn't hit you with the bat because I would, shouldn't, like, cause you suffering, right? So you, you don't do that comparative case with different people when you're talking about whether you're harming somebody or not. So Parvich just says, well, that can't be the reason why uh, we think depletion is wrong or we think that, you know, um, emitting fossil fuels, continuing to emitting fossil fuels, to the point of, like, you know, two plus degree centigrade increase is wrong. There has to be some other reason why it's wrong. 
And so he thinks any, any yeah, and, ethical view, no, which says any ethical view, which assumes the same person's um, idea or notion is going to fall afoul and is not going to be able to give you good reason to reject depletion. And so that theory would then need to be rejected. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and then he also talks about how like, you know, different people would reason differently in those different contexts and come up with different solutions. So like, Depletion might seem bad to us now, but 50 years from now, because they would be completely different people, they'd be asking completely different questions, facing different scenarios, facing different predicaments. And who knows, we might have depleted them in one resource, but then over the course of 50 years or 100 years, um, because of the complex nature of technology and societal development, et cetera, et cetera, um, that they would have kind of – they wouldn't even be facing the same problems that we're facing now. So they'd be asking an entirely different – or they'd be facing an entirely set of – a different set of challenges and so it's almost like again this is where i go to there's something there's like this speculative gamble that he doesn't he doesn't use this language but it does seem that when we engage in that type of like identarian thinking like that the typical let's say environmental policy approach takes is that it's entirely based on what i would call like a forced abstract speculation that it's reproducing the same conditions based on the logic of the present and then projecting it and kind of forcing it into the future and then fashioning the future in the image of the president present and then just kind of reproducing those same conditions because it's not actually allowing for, let's say, the principle of non-identity to really um, affect how it is that we engage with the problems of the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, and in addition to your point about you know, people in the future addressing different problems, there's you know an issue here that um, – Harvard brings up is, you know, he thinks any sort of like deontological um, accounts of what's right and what's wrong regarding future people or any account that talks about future people's rights isn't going to resolve this problem. Since if yeah. you ask a future person, well, you know, do you, do you think that your rights have been violated? They, they would say, well, maybe yes, but I consent to it because otherwise I wouldn't exist, right? If, if you hadn't done depletion, if you hadn't, you know, emitted all the fossil fuels, I wouldn't exist. And I'm glad I exist because I have at least a life minimally worth living. So, you know, it kind of sucks that you guys did that, but I guess I'm okay with it. And I'm glad you did ultimately because I exist. Otherwise I wouldn't. Mm. And that seems like the point where I think that, okay, you're clearly seeing some of the issue here, right? Because it's kind of reducing the entire idea of wronging someone to whether they consent to it or not. Um, mm. Which of course completely ignores the conditions under which consent is given which here seem incredibly important, right? Um, a person can consent to uh, you know, slave labor if the only options before them are slave labor or death. And that does not mean right. that you're treating someone rightly to uh, offer them those options in the first place, especially yeah. when you have the choice over what options they'll have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Parfit's ultimate conclusion here um, is he thinks that Clearly, we can't talk about individual persons being worse off as being the reason why we shouldn't make the you know environment worse. or shouldn't just you know make the world worse overall. So instead, he wants to have some sort. He also like the uh, total impersonal principle or something. And here's where you see the consequentialist uh, stuff coming out. He says instead of um, thinking about individual persons, we have to just think about total aggregate um, like badness or, or worseness as the reason why we shouldn't. Due depletion, right? Um, and so he, he yeah. kind of talks about here about impersonalizing our reasons for acting ethically. We need to not think about our ethical reasons as being towards individual persons, but being impersonal generally, kind of like, um, you know, totally abstract and quantifiable in that sense. And he thinks that that ultimately is kind of the answer um, to the non, non identity problem, which is to stop thinking about individual persons, but instead about uh, the aggregation uh, in total of better offness or worse offness. And that does get you around the non-identity problem. The problem is that then leads to the repugnant conclusion, uh, which do you want to talk about that? Or do you want to save that for like maybe a later time? Um, Gosh. Yeah. Can, should we, can we do like a part two on this? And do you want to? Yeah, let's do a part two on this because I, I have a real problem with this entire approach, right? Um, and I'll just give like a little teaser of my problem and then let's let's put an ellipsis here and let's do part two next week. My problem is, is like, how do you actually measure, 
right? He just assumes this logic of quantification. But I was thinking about this with, with regard to myself, right? Like, I have highs and lows in life, but I think the way that I experience highs and lows are very different from the way that Troy experiences highs and lows. Or I was thinking about this in relation to an ex-girlfriend that I dated a long time ago in LA. You would think that way. <laughs> and, <laughs> but like, I I had a really difficult time understanding her lows because I don't have lows that go that low, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, and this isn't to say that I don't have moments when I'm sad or quote unquote depressed, but I feel like it's almost a disservice to use the word depressed because I'm not depressed when I've been around people who are actually fucking depressed, right? Like, yeah, I lose a little bit of motivation and sometimes I don't want to get out of bed and I'm fucking tired or whatever. Yeah. Those are all the quote, unquote, those are like the symptoms that are like, oh, if you experience these then you're depressed. No, man, that's very different because I've been around someone who's clinically depressed, who is in therapy and who is dealing with issues. And that's a different low than what I'm used to experiencing as my lows. Like even my lowest of lows don't even match her middle of the road lows, right? So I don't know. I, I have a real problem with measurement and mathematization and quantification when it comes to these types of experiences, you know? Yeah, I think so like there's a There's a qualia there that I just feel like he's not accounting for that I feel like is excessive of the logic of quantification. Yeah, and especially if you consider the fact that, you know, this kind of logic might lead you to say that the person who experiences those lows is closer to having a life, a life not worth living than you do, which just seems completely wrong. Like that seems like the yeah. reductio of the view, right? Yeah, and that was the other thing I was like, when he's talking about these different places, I'm like, so does that mean that there are maybe even countries that we would say are like the country Z? as opposed to the country A, and that's kind of foreshadowing for next week, but I'm like, that there are countries that, in in the aggregate, that are just like conglomerates of lives not worth living, <laughs> but nevertheless, they kind of like add up together to equal the same quantity of like a smaller population in like the United States or something like that. Or like that, Sweden, that has, right? Or Sweden, yeah, exactly. I was like, wait a second here. So like, the Swedish people, of course, like the white Western Northern Hemisphere people, they have qualitative lives worth living, but like sub-Saharan African nations, you know, like, eh, not so much, right? Those aren't lives worth living because they deal with suffering. And I'm like, ah, but then that's why it's called the repugnant conclusion, right? Yes. Yeah, at the very least, Perfect, I think, is, is willing um, and he should be celebrated for the fact that he's willing to say, you know what, this kind of logic actually does lead to this repugnant conclusion. And so something's gone wrong. Now, what he thinks has gone wrong, I don't think that he gives a very good answer for. But I think it's, it's good that he actually sees that this kind of logic has an inherent flaw in it. Okay, well then let's do this. Then this will give me time too to like reread this section and, and kind of chew on the cut a little bit more over the week. And let's, let's do part two next week. Yeah, that would be good. Cool. All right, sick. So let's jump into our final segment. Before Thanksgiving, by the way, I just realized that. That's why we're actually, people don't know this, but we're recording this earlier than we normally record it because T-Roy is going to be go doing some family stuff this week. But this is our last episode before Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving, Troy, by the way. You too, Matt. Did they, you going to do anything for Thanksgiving over in uh, Sydney? You know what? I kind of completely forgot that it was coming until my <laughs> mom was... My mom was like, it's Thanksgiving. What are you doing? I was like, oh, shit. I didn't even think about it. I'll have to do something. Like everywhere I've been in the world, no matter what, I've either gotten together with American people or I've gone to like a turkey buffet with a friend or something like that. I'm like, I just got to get turkey engraving and stuffing. You just have to do it, you know? So Are, are I'm there sure turkeys I'll in Australia? <laughs> they have wild turkeys, bro. Oh, yeah? No, I, actually, no, that's wild chickens. What am I talking oh. about? <laughs> it's same shit. Wild chickens. Like, how are wild chickens different than domesticated kinds? Because they're just, like, you're just walking around at the beach, and there's a fucking, you just see chicken walk by you. You're Whoa. Like, what is this? <laughs> what is That's going awesome. on? That's awesome. It, yeah, it's weird, man. You'll just be at the beach, and I shit you not, there'll be a couple chickens that just, like, walk by you, or you'll be walking through the bush on a trail, and there'll be, like, a handful of chickens just chilling. You're like, what the fuck? That's lunch right there, man. <laughs> um, That's pretty great. Right. I didn't know that there were wild chickens anymore. It's like wild cattle. Is there a wild cattle somewhere? I have no idea if there are wild cattle. That is actually a conundrum. That's a I mean, very do, good question. Do cows in like India count as wild? They, I would imagine. They're, they're urban, right? I, mean, I don't even know. 
Who knows? And I wonder, are they are they qualitatively different than the domesticated cows? Because, you know, like, <laughs> wild pigs become, like, boar, right? And they grow, like, teeth and shit like that. Yeah. Whereas when, when they're domesticated, then they just don't. So I wonder if it's, like, the same with cows. Like, do they all, like, they like grow, grow their horns hair out, and shit? get tattoos, and start listening to punk rock? <laughs> get their noses pierced and shit. <laughs> yeah, dude. All right, um, all that BSing aside, it's time for the Sticky Leaves. This is the time in the episode where one of us gets to talk about something that is giving us meaning in a potentially meaningless universe. So, T-Roy, what's making you happy this week? So, this week I saw uh, in concert someone who I'm pretty sure I've talked about on the podcast before, and that's Jeffrey Lewis. Do you remember him at all? Yeah, you talked about him a couple weeks ago, right? That's the dude that played the punk rock medley thing. Yeah, exactly. Um he is, uh, for, for me at least, I, I first found out about him by seeing the YouTube video of him playing the uh, history of punk rock on the Lower East Side, um, which is a wonderful uh, little video where he does like a seven minute, incredibly uh, like rich and contentful and fast history of punk rock in New York City up until the time it was stolen by England um, over, you know, some like basic guitar chords. And it's, it's really wonderful and it's incredible. He has the whole thing memorized because it's almost like a book in and of itself. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but uh, I've loved him for that. And, and, and he does, he's part of this kind of like anti-folk um, tradition in like the, you know, it started in like the, the mid nineties and has uh, kind of become a thing in the mid two thousands, a little bit more of the indie side um, has come out in that genre, like Andrew Jackson, Jihad, if you know them, they're kind of, of the anti-folk tradition. And it's sort of like, it's called anti-folk, but if anything, it's more folk than folk because, you know, folk is supposed to be like purposefully like lowbrow, you know, not sort of academic mm -hmm. um, and institutional. And um, this kind of folk is like is more like that than what we, what we currently call folk, which is usually much more Baroque than folk really um, would be based on its like nomenclature. So mm -hmm. uh, it's basically just kind of folk stripped of any pretensions towards being highbrow so it's like you know going back to the roots it's like the punk rock of folk um and uh jeffrey lewis is from that uh sort of tradition um especially like in, in new york city and i saw him live this week uh in this really dingy dirty dive bar um mm. which fit like 35 people and everyone was smacked up against each other um and it was wonderful I had it was one of the best concerts I've at least most fun concerts. I don't know if you can quantify it as being like objectively the best, but I had hmm. one of those like fun times I've ever had at a concert at least that I can remember. Wow. Um, just in terms of pure enjoyment, he uh, didn't play the history of punk song, but that's okay. Didn't need to do that. Um, he played a lot of his his new album, which is called Bad Wiring, and his his new album is a little bit more of the indie indie folk. Um, side of things um, and it's really fun it's like kind of pop punk with some folk edges and some punk edges um, like old school punk edges I mean and uh, if you want an earworm just look up the song LPs um, which has a there's a video on, on YouTube a music video for it and it's basically about addiction to vinyl records hmm. um, and it's it's really funny it's got his sense of humor and his quick wit um, in it and it's and I really love it um, and then he also has this really fun way of doing things where, you know, most of his songs sound kind of the same. He has a style that he does and he makes no bones about the fact that he kind of just is consistent with it and doesn't change up his, his sound very much. So to make the concerts a little bit more dynamic, he does these little vignettes of like dog, he calls them documentaries in the middle of his set, but they're not really documentaries. What he does is he, he's a comic book uh, illustrator. Um, he does lots of, you know, really uh, cool, uh, comics and drawings and so he makes all these comics about like one thing is the history of communism mm -hmm. so he just tells all these tales of uh the history of communism there's like 10 i think um in comic books so he draws them all and colors them all and then he he used to actually hold the comic up um and then and then sing into the microphone and like flip the pages to the audience uh if you've got videos on youtube that's what he's doing but in this concert he actually had them on a projector so he projected the comics up onto a screen um, and flipped the projector with his laptop and then sang um, these kind of like, you know, um, poetic rhymes about the history of communism. And so then this, this concert that mm -hmm. I saw, he did um, the history of the Cuban revolution against Batista. Um, and it was so fun and cool and clever. 
And the fact that he you know, interspersed uh, these things in between um, the regular, you know, indie folk songs um, made it such more dynamic and fun. And then he'd have these little spoken word sections where he'd basically like recite a poem, which is really funny. There's one poem about a Jewish guy and a pigeon who find that they actually have some similarities in life. Um, Jewish New York guy, hmm. which is great. And then he had another one, which was, he called it a horror movie. Um, where he, you can see this on YouTube, it's, it's, it's really cool on YouTube as well, uh, a song called Creeping Brain, where he just basically does like a song version of this comic that he wrote about a brain that comes out of the ocean and destroys most of humanity, but then decides that it was wrong to do that and becomes like a sage, like a god to human beings, and then eventually dies, and people celebrate its, uh, its life. It's like a horror movie turned into like, a, into like Gandhi or something. <laughs> and he, the whole thing is following this comic that he that he uh, developed and that he wrote and drew, and he flips through the whole comic as he's singing the song, and so it's just he has this wonderful sense about him. Um, it's both enjoyable and you feel like you actually have some community because there's there's this dynamism to the whole thing and this like sense of of communal care about it, which is something that I think folk and punk both when they're at their best have that sense, right? They're not alienating. They're mm. they're like uniting, like they're community yeah. forming um, totally. kinds of music. And he combines that so well in a way that you just don't really get, I think, anymore from those genres. Folk a lot of times is alienating because it's usually kind of depressive and purely expressive of like the individual's feelings. Mm. Um, in a way that, you know, you can have some empathy towards that, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily unite you with um with like the singer songwriter, right? And he yeah really eschews, eschews that stuff and develops this kind of uniting harmonious sense. I definitely came out, almost, I feel like everyone kind of felt this, just general happiness after this show. Mm. And then the best part was, I think, they played uh, as an encore, uh, one of my all-time favorite songs, which is Prayer to God by the band Shellac, who I've probably talked about before. They're one of my favorite bands, Steve Albini, who is one of the most famous record producers who produced like, you know, Nirvana and um, all sorts of stuff in the 90s was the um, front man and vocalist and, and guitarist of Shellac. And they have this song called Prayer to God, which is about uh, this guy who kills his ex and his ex's um, new boyfriend or husband or whatever and prays to God that they'll die. And the whole thing is about the prayer to God <laughs> about how to kill them. Um, it's, it's really clever and funny. And they played this song as an encore to the end, which is completely tonally the opposite of the rest of the music <laughs> that he played. Uh, but it added a nice little element to it. Um, so yeah, I, I love Jeffrey Lewis. He's not someone that I would I would hold up as being like objectively the greatest singer songwriter in the genre or of our time. There's something special and unique about him, and very real about him that I that I appreciate. And so there's plenty of stuff on YouTube to see about him, from the history of punk stuff to live shows to these comic demonstrations to even some there's like documentary footage of him. Like is one of him walking around his apartment talking about all of his records and his drawings and. He's a really, really oh, yeah, interesting and cool that one. person. Yeah, so I would recommend anyone yeah. out there who is unaware of of Jeffrey Lewis to go check him out because uh, what you'll find there, I think, is very worthwhile and very uplifting as well. Did he have a full band with him, or was it just him and like his guitar and his laptop? No, he had a uh, bassist and a drummer. Oh, cool. His new stuff is um, is full band, so it's got that more like okay. indie folk pop punk um, kind of edge to it. Ah, oh, that sounds kind of fun, man. And what was the name of the song that you said, LPs? Yeah, so I think you especially should check out the song LPs. If you if okay. that's an earworm for you, then I think you'll you'll dig his stuff. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I only know of the medley, the 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 history of punk rock one, and then I did I watched that video of him when he's like talking about like the his records and like the art on his walls and shit like that. I, for some whatever reason, I've I've seen both of those a couple of times, but that's it. I don't think I was I don't, I don't even think i knew that he was like that he produced other stuff i thought he was just like a random like new york artist dude i didn't even I know, know dude, he was he, like a full-time musician he comes out he comes across just like that he has that sort of like you know late 70s or mid 70s punk edge which is i'm totally diy i kind of have to be diy because otherwise i couldn't exist yeah. right but still popular just popular enough to continue doing music and continue doing his art over and over again so um, it's like that perfect middle ground where, you know, obviously I, I wish him the most success in the world so he can you know, be comfortable and, and focused on his art and not have to worry about like paying his, his like, bills and stuff. But there's something about kind of that little bit of precarity that, 
that keeps you a little pure, maybe. Or maybe I'm like accepting the dogma here. Maybe it gives him an edge a little bit, you know? Maybe. I don't want to think that, but there's, there may be something to the to the idea that you, it gives you an edge to be a little bit precarious. Yeah. God, that fucking sucks because we don't want to justify precarity here, but. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's terrible. But it's, but it's fucking true, man. You ever been to Laguna Beach and seen the art that people draw on Laguna Beach? It's like Wyland, which is just like whales and dolphins jumping and shit <laughs> like that. Like that's Southern Orange County yuppie art. It's very difficult to produce good art when you're rich and upper middle class and everyone is pretty and the weather's perfect and the food is great. Like, you know. Like, what are you going to draw? You're going to draw sunsets and fucking whales breaching out of the water. That's about yeah, fuck it. That, fuck that shit. <laughs> you know what is the case, though? So, yeah, I think you're right. Being, like, too well off can be a problem when it comes to the motivations for, like, making good creative stuff, right? Um, but you don't have to be poor to have the kind of precarity and difficulty and even suffering that sometimes produces great art. Like, life itself gives you enough of that. You know? Or you have to be really rich to the point where, like, like, see, I feel like yuppie rich doesn't really, because there's also a superficiality where you're still trying to keep up with the Joneses sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But then there's also, like, where you're just, like, super rich, and like then you Jeff just don't Bezos have to work. Rich? Like what? Like Jeff Bezos rich? Um, like Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos' son, that kind of rich, right? <laughs> where, like, you're just living off daddy's money, but you don't have to, like be involved with the daily workings of whatever your company is but like you go to private school and shit like that and you can be like an amazing game designer because you have no responsibilities so you just can play video games all day and like design video games and shit like that like you know like the history is filled with people who are rich who have been great writers because they just didn't have to work they could just read all the classics and then write poetry you know yeah, I do wonder that there's some sense in which, yeah, that gives you the time to to spend really working on, you know, your your craft um, and perfecting it. But then the there's something about like if you're if you're so rich to the point where you're so comfortable that there's there's very little that's sort of um, there's like no conflict in your life. Like, how are you really going to create art, which is, like necessarily needs the dynamism of conflict um, to be great? There's something, I mean, everyone's going to have that because even like the richest and most comfortable people are going to suffer at some point, right? And that's going to motivate yeah. them. But there's something in which I, like, it just kind of alienates you from but isn't, like, everyday human experience. Totally. But I, I feel like a lot of times when you get the people that are wealthy, isn't precisely the thing that, that fuels their angst, the desire to get out of what they seem, what, what they perceive as being like a caged existence, like that you must become the the next CEO of my company, or um, you must self hating rich people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what happens is they like, it's like uh, God. I'm you're gonna hate me for this reference, but what I'm picturing in my head is the film Far and Away, and you know Nicole Kidman. Yeah, and she like. She has to run off with Tom Cruise to get to America because she just wants to get away from the rich, like Irish life with that this she poor, has. Yeah, this poor guy, Tom Cruise. Yeah, she's got to <laughs> slum it. Got to slum it with the sexy poor dude. Nothing like slumming it with Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean. Like that's that's what I'm picturing in my head, and that's where the angst comes from. It's like I don't want the life. You know, it's the fucking James Vanderbeek from Varsity Blues. I don't want your life. Yeah, it's such you know? a naive like conflict, though, right? Oh, I just, I'm not going to be what daddy tells me I have to be. Like, come on, dude. Like, people got bigger problems than that. That is how pop punk was born, motherfucker. <laughs> Every pop punk kid is a fail son of some Exxon exec. Yeah, dude. Got to get out of this town. <laughs> I don't want what you want from me. I got to get out of the bubble. Like, come on. There was a video on this. I can't remember who it was. One of those, one of those, like, guys that does commentary on like pop punk or pop punk music or something like that and was talking about how like why is it that all these pop punk bands always sing about like getting out of town and it was so funny because i laughed out loud when i watched <laughs> it because my band our first ep when i was 16 years old 17 years old it was called life in the bubble and we used to constantly just <laughs> think that living in orange county we were stuck in this fucking bubble and we actually had a street name when you're driving on uh on the five freeway once you get to culver 
which is in Irvine, which is still South Orange County. But in our dumbass minds, we thought that once we get north of Culver, then we're moving out of the bubble because we're on our way to L.A., which is still like 30 minutes away from 40 minutes away from Culver. But that was like our idea, right? Is like we're on the way to getting out of the bubble. So like what is This is it? where like, real people exist, where they maybe right. even like take the bus. <laughs> Yeah, dude, exactly. Exactly, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think that's a pretty good uh like analysis of of the history of pop punk right there. That might be it. You might have yeah. solved it. I fucking lived it, man. I don't need to solve it. I fucking lived it. <laughs> I don't think most people in that uh in that space have the kind of like self-analytical ability to to recognize that fact though. Yeah, see, that's why I need, with the next album that I make, I need it to be, like, self-aware criticism of the pop-punk tropes and pop-punk ethos, right? Yeah. For yeah. sure. All right, I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, man. No, yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to be hopping into bed here, and I'm going to listen to some Jeffrey Lewis while I lay in bed. Yeah, dude. Get those LPs. Sounds good, man. All right, sweet. So then I guess what we have uh, decided from this episode is that we are going to be doing part two next week, and we're going to be talking about this repugnant conclusion and quantification of life and how do you measure and all this other shit that comes out of the non-identity principle. So stay tuned for that because, uh, yeah, I'll be armed and ready to go because I'm going to reread the chapter now. So be ready, Troy. Yeah, and a retroactive happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. This will probably come out after Thanksgiving, so... Or we're wishing it to you now, so it still counts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll be Thanksgiving weekend that it comes out, so people will still be in their food comas or whatever. Did someone ever tell you back in the church days that prayer was retroactively effective since God lives outside of time? Say, so, uh, eh? I, maybe? I don't, I, I can't remember. I heard oh, this yeah. once. I think, I think someone was saying, like, someone that they, that they, that they were close to was having surgery, um, and it had already occurred, uh, you know, temporally speaking. Yeah. But they hadn't heard anything yet, and so they they still prayed for that person. And they said the the logic was, prayer can still be effective retroactively because God is outside of time. So God knows and accepts this prayer, um, like coterminously, cotemporally, or whatever, with the surgery actually happening. So you can actually, you know, pray for things and wish people things retroactively, and they still count. Get the fuck out of here, man. And I assume if you hold to a B theory of time, then you don't even have to have God there. You can just say, like, I'm wishing you a happy Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving, and it still counts. It's like some selling of indulgences shit <laughs> without the exchange of money. Come on, man. Yeah, it's pretty weird. I was probably turned off by that idea. Yeah, get out of here. All right. Well, good fun. Um, but yes, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And uh, like we said at the top, patreon.com slash owls at dawn if you want to support us if you're already a patron go to the patreon page and make sure you comment on what episode topic you want us to address in the new democracy motherfuckers um, suggestion post that we put up there and if you're not a patron and you want to get in on that uh, it's a two dollar a month tier and you can get access to becoming a member of the democracy motherfuckers parliament and I think that's pretty much it, unless there's anything else you want to say, Troy. Just one more thing I can think of, dude. What's that? Das Vidania, Mary Constance. Yeah!